بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله محمد عليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته Zufar's fatwa is followed in 17 matters <clears throat> in the Hanafi madhab over that of the Imam and his two companions. There are several recensions of these fatwas, as in Abu Zaid, Abu Zaid al Dabusi, um, Ta'is al Nadar, al Nasafi's poem on Khilaf and his commentaries and other works. In Al-Basra, <coughs> Zufar reached the point where people would leave Uthman ibn Muslim al-Bati's circle to come study under him. <coughs> when the Basrians expressed admiration at Zufar's fiqh, he said, if only you had seen Muhammad ibn al-Hasan. Another time he said Abu Yusuf, is the most knowledgeable of those that came before. Even more would he say, this is the position of Abu Hanifa until the Basrans, Bas, Basrians became far more amenable to the Imam and his fiqh after having, <coughs> after having borne hostility towards him before. al Hussein ibn al-Walid said, he, Zufar, <coughs> was the strongest of the Imam's companions and the sharpest in his analysis. Ibn Abd al-Bar Abd al said in Al-Intiqa that Zufar succeeded Abu Hanifa at the head of his study circle, then Abu Yusuf, then Muhammad ibn al-Hasan. <clears throat> Abd rahman ibn Malik ibn Mikhwal narrated that a man asked Abu Hanifa, last night I drank fermented juice and I'm not sure whether I divorced my wife or not. He replied, she's your wife until you become sure that you divorced her. He went to Sufyan Authority and asked him the same question. He replied, go and declare that you have broke her back if you did not divorce her, it is of no consequence. Then he asked Sharik ibn Abdul Abdullah, who replied, divorce her, then bring her back. Then he asked Zufar, who said, did you ask anyone else before me? He said yes and named all the above. Zufar endorsed Ab Abu Hanifa's reply and praised Sufyan's, but laughed at Sharik's then said, this is like a man who passed by water splashing, some of which reached his garment. Whereupon, Abu Hanifa said, your garment is clean and prayer complete until you become sure that the water being dirty. While Sufyan said, wash it. And if it were clean in the first place, it is only cleaner now. But Sharik said, in effect, go piss on it. <laughs> Then wash it. Muhammad ibn al Hassan said, I saw Zafar debate Abu Hanifa, Abu Yusuf. The latter would overcome him with narrations from Abu Hanifa and reports, but when he came to analogy, Zafar would win. Al Fadl ibn Duqayn said, Zafar would sit squarely and lean against a pillar a pillar, wearing a big white palansua, while Abu Yusuf would shift a lot during debate, so that Zafar would say to him at times, where are you running to, off to? Pick any door, i.e. chapter you wish. Hamad and Muhammad ibn Amara said, I saw Abu Yusuf one day with Abu I saw Abu Hanifa one day with Abu Yusuf on his left and Zafar on his right, debating each other and flatly refuting each other question after question. 
from morning to dhuhr. While Abu Hanifa <coughs> refereed, when the call to prayer was raised, Abu Hanifa slapped his hand on Zafar's thigh and said, do not seek leadership in a country where Abu Yusuf can be found. Abu Hanifa said, our companions here are 36. 28 are fit for judgeship, six are fit for giving fatwa, and two pointing to Abu Yusuf and Zafar are fit for keeping the judges and muftis in line. Shaddad ibn Hakim <coughs> asked Asad bin Amr, who possessed more fiqh, Abu Yusuf or Zafar. He replied, Zafar was more God-fearing. Shaddad said, I am asking about fiqh. Asad replied, Asad replied, Shaddad, with fear of God, a man rises Abu, Mu, Abu Mut, Muti' al-Balkhi al reportedly called Zafar a hujja, a great proof among people. But as for Abu Yusuf, the world dazzled him a little bit. Al-Kawthari al al comments, this is the lot of those who become judges. People gossip about them, yet the common welfare is not achieved except through upright judges. Ibn al-Wardi al was right when he said, truly all people are enemies to the holders of judgeship, and I mean the upright ones. <coughs> Waqir would go to Zafar mornings and to Abu Yusuf evenings, then focused on Zafar since he had more time. Abu, among Zafar's sayings, whoever sit Whoever sits to teach before his time is brought low. No doubt he took this from the Imam, who said something very similar. Al Khatib, in his Tariq Baghdad, also listed the following among the companions of Abu Hanifa, as reported by Ismail ibn Hamad, Asad ibn Amr al Bajali. Afiya al Audi, Dawood al Ta'i, al Qasim ibn Man, al, al Mas'udi, Ali ibn Mushir, Yahya ibn Zakariya ibn Abi Zaida, Hibban and Mindo, both sons of Ali al Anazi. None of them reached the level of Zafar and the two companions. Abu Ali al Hassan ibn Ziyad al Lu'i al Kufi al Ansari died 204. One of the major pious and learned Imams of Fiqh also took Fiqh from Abu Hanifa as well as from Zafar and Abu Yusuf. Dawood al Ta'i. Abu Sulaiman Daud ibn Nusayr al Kufi al Ta'i rahmatullah alayhi died 160 or 165, narrated hadith from a number of the Tabi'in and took fiqh from Abu Hanifa, who predicted that he would devote himself entirely to worship. Ibn Ziyad al Lu'lu'i reported, Safar and Daud al Ta'i al Kufi. At first were colleagues, then Dawood left fiqh for ascetism, while Zafar combined the two. Ibn, Ibn al Jawzi in Sifat al Safwa narrates that Abu Hanifa said to Dawood, Abu Sulaiman, as for the instrument, we have mastered it. Dawood said, What is left? Abu Hanifa said, What is left is to put it into practice. Dawood said, when I heard this, my soul stirred. My soul stirred me to the seclusion and solitariness. But I told it, sit with them for a year and do not raise a peep during that time. During that year, he said, a question would come up which made me crave to answer it more than someone parched craves water, but I would not answer. After one year, he went into seclusion. Among Dawood's sayings, 
Fear Allah and keep piety with your parents. Fast from the world and make death your breakfast. Run away from people as you would from a lion, without dispa disparaging them nor leaving their congregation. Be satisfied with a little from the world together with safety in religion, just as worldly people are satisfied with the world together with corruption in, relig in their religion. Despair is the natural end of our deeds, but our hearts drag us to hope. Beware, lest Allah find you where he forbade you to be. Beware, lest he, he not find you where he ordered you to be. Be ashamed of his nearness to you and his power over you. To a student who wished to learn archery, archery is fine, but your days are counted. Look well how you spend them. Abu Bakr. Hadith scholars have specified certain conditions that must be met by anyone who receives and carries the hadith and then delivers and transmits it to others. These conditions are basically concerned with the legal capacity of the receivers and transmitters of hadith. One who receives the hadith must be a discerning person who has attained an age that enables him to listen to and retain the hadith and conveys it to others. The precise age is a subject of disagreement, but the legal capacity of a receiver of hadith is known to be different to the legal capacity for purposes of civil and commercial transactions. A discerning child of seven and according to some so five years of age may not be capable of concluding a transaction or contract and yet may be able to comprehend what he hears and retain it or even transmit it to others. Many have specified that the child should be able to understand speech addressed to him and be able to give an answer. The child in question may write what he hears or may, and, or may not and the ulama have not specified any particular age for purposes of writing. The companions and others have thus accepted the hadith transmitted by Mahmoud ibn Rabi' who said, I, when I was a boy of five, I remember the Prophet وسلم, took water from a bucket used for drawing water out of a well with his mouth and threw it on my face. The question as to whether a disbeliever, kafir, is qualified to be a recipient and, car and carrier of hadith is answered by the, in the affirmative provided that he is a Muslim when he transmits the hadith to others. A kafir is disqualified to receive hadith but not to transmit it. To accept hadith transmitted by a disbeliever would mean that Muslims are bound by his report that consequently becomes a part of the religion which is unacceptable. One who transmits hadith must also be a person of just character, adl, possession of just character or adala, although often linked with observance of religious duties, avoidance of major sins, some particularly degrading minor sins, or even profanities that are not necessarily sinful yet degrading, such as the company of corrupt, per corrupt persons, indulgence in demeaning jokes, etc. Yet adala is a holistic attribute of character which inspires confidence in the truth, uprightness and reliability of a person. There is uh, This is a question of integrity, honesty and taqwa that people are often known either to have it or not. And lastly, the transmitter of hadith must have a retentive memory, a dhabt, which means that he was alert and attentive when receiving the hadith and retained it, retained it with due diligence as to its accuracy from the time of reception until delivery and transmission. A person of sound memory that is able or with or without the aid of writing to ensure the integrity of hadith against error, distortion and change is usually qualified as retentive. Uh, the, uh, the quality uh, of retentiveness is also known by the virtue of the fact that a person's speech is in agreement with the work of those who are known to be upright and retentive. An occasional discrepancy or disagreement is of no consequence provided that the general caliber and purpose of one's work is agreeable when compared to the works of recognized and reliable transmitters. If instances of conflict and discordance are frequent, the quality of loved will be difficult to establish. Transmission of hadith is consequently not accepted from a person who fails to fulfill the five conditions of uh, Ada, which are Islam, majority, sound intellect, 
just character and retentiveness, whereas there is basically one precondition for reception, tahammul, which is intellectual discernment, at tamiz. We, we will now turn to the methods of reception, tahammul, and those of delivery, ada of hadith, which are separately discussed as follows. Methods of, re uh, of reception, uh, al-akhz wa tahammul. The transmitter of hadith is likely to have received the hadith in any of the following ways, which the hadith scholars have identified in an order of decreasing scale of reliability. But before reviewing these methods, it should be noted that they were applicable in earlier times, that is, before the documentation of hadith in reliable collections by scholars such as Al Bukhari and Muslim. The methods of receiving hadith that are discussed below effectively cease to apply after the compilation of As Siha, As Sitta, the six sound collections of hadith. Nowadays, we simply receive the hadith through the written records of hadith by learned men who make, made the effort of verifying and recording the hadith with diligence and care to ensure that they only recorded hadith from transmitters who they verified as upright and reliable. Ever since the availability of these highly acclaimed collections, scholars and students in search of hadith simply locate the hadith in these sources and refer to it, and they do not on the whole need to verify the reliability of the chain of transmission and text of the hadith, nor do they need, nor need normally to refer to the various other aspects of hadith of the hadith methodology but this facility was not available prior to the compilation of the major collections of hadith because of the existence in early times of doubtful and fabricated matter into the general body of hadith transmitters of hadith were required to specify as to how exactly did they receive it themselves was it through direct hearing as sama which is regarded to be the most sound, the most reliable of all methods or some other manner of reception. This information was necessary for the scholars of hadith to enable them to evaluate the grades of reliability of the hadith they were recording in their collections. The eight methods of reception that are known to the known to hadith methodology are as follows. Direct hearing as sama. The recipient of hadith according to this method has received the hadith through a direct hearing of the hadith from a teacher or a sheikh who has recited it either from memory or from a written record. The teacher in this case is most likely to be someone in the generations following that of the companions simply because hadith verification and transmission through accurate recitation and recording actually started after that time. When a companion narrated a hadith from the Prophet وسلم, he or she was not normally faced with the question of how he or she actually received it from the Prophet ﷺ. Although the question is not irrelevant and even the companions have often indicated the occasion or context in which they heard the Prophet ﷺ saying something or approving a particular act or conduct, since there was basically no intermediate links or context involved, questions were not asked to the manner of tahammul and ada, reception and delivery of hadith. These methods were identified basically through the development of hadith scholarship and emergence of learned men of hadith who taught hadith to a circle of disciples and it was through this teaching that the disciples became qualified to transmit the hadith down the line of Isnad. The disciple who received the hadith may have heard and written it down at the time of hearing or wrote it afterwards. If he was the only one present, he would be likely to transmit the hadith by the word Samiatu, I heard so and so or Haddathani, so and so spoke to me or Akhbarani or Anbaani so and so informed me. Directly hearing when indicated by the use of these expressions ranks highest on the scale of reliability as it inspires confidence in the accuracy of the message that was received in the first place. If there were more people present or when the disciple was in a group of other disciples, he would be in a position to use the plural form of these terms in each case by saying, for example, that we had, it was reported to us, we were informed, سَمِعْنَا حَدَّثَنَا أَخْبَرَنَا أَنْبَعَنَا and so forth. The hadith scholars usually require the transmitter not to use the plural term if he heard it alone from his teacher and to specify carefully if the use of the plural term was justified and also to mention those who heard it together with him. According to the variant opinion, the plural terms haddathana and akhbarana are in a sense preferable to samiatu in that they convey a deliberate and purposeful address whereas samiatu does not integrate that sense of deliberate address by the teacher um, um, teacher to the disciple. Be that as, as it may, direct hearing in the singular is still considered stronger. Sometimes familiarity and practice may, 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 take, place, may take the place of some verbal expressions. Most of the reports from Ibn Juraiji, for instance, simply quote um, him by the expression, Qala Ibn Juraiji. Ibn Juraiji said, 
as it was known of Ibn Juraj that he did not narrate anything without directly hearing it himself in the first place. Recitation or rehearsal, al qiraa al shaykh the disciple in this case leads back to the shaykh from memory or record or the hadith which he has known from his shaykh or someone else and wants the shaykh to verify its accuracy. This method, which is also known as al-arb, requires that the reader, comp reader comprehends what he reads and the shaykh is alert and awake also so as to be um, awake so as to be able to spot any error or distortion in the rehearsal. The disciple who then transmits the hadith is likely to use a phrase such as I read to the shaykh who was listening, qara'tu ala shaykh wa or if someone else from those present reports it that he may he may say this was read to read to the sheikh who was listening or such expressions that must however indicate the element of recitation or, or qira'a therein to distinguish it from as um, uh, there, there is disagreement as to the relative strength of this method compared to direct hearing. According to an opinion which is attributed to Imam Abu Hanifa, recitation is stronger than hearing as there is an element of repetition and endorsement therein. Imam Malik has considered them to be equal and this is said to be the position generally of the scholars of Hijaz and Kufa, including Imam al-Bukhari. Having reviewed the, these variant views, Ibn Salah wrote that the correct position is that direct hearing still remains the stronger of the two methods. وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد بسم الله محمد means of revelation وحي is the, is the sense of revelation وحي in the sense of revelation is guidance from God for his creation brought by the prophets who received the word from God through one of the means mentioned in the following Quranic verse it is not fitting for a man that God should speak to him except by inspiration or from behind a, veil, behind a veil or by sending a messenger to reveal with God's permission what God, God wills. For he is most high, most wise. Means of revelation are inspiration. Example, in a dream, see... Um, Chapter, Surah 37, verse 102, where it is repeated that Ibrahim received guidance in a vision while asleep to sacrifice his son. Next, speech hidden away. See Surah 27, verse 8, where it is related that God spoke to Musa from the fire. Next, words, speech sent through a special messenger from God. See Surah 2, verse 97, where it is related that God sent the archangel Jibreel salam, to the messenger as a messenger to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to reveal his message. The Quran revealed to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the last of God's messengers, received the revelation of the Quran through a special messenger sent by God for this purpose. The angel Jibreel salam, who recited to him God's words exactly. The descent of the Quran. According to Suyuti, on the basis of three reports from Abdullah ibn Abbas in Hakim, Bayhaki, and Nasai, the Quran descended in two stages from the low al mahfur the well preserved tablet, to the lowest of the heavens, Bayt al Izza of the world all together in the Laylatul Qadr. Next, from the heavens to earth in stages throughout the 23 years of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's prophethood and first in the Laylatul Qadr of Ramadan through the angel Jibreel Alayhi Salam. This second descent from the heaven to the heart of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is referred to in Surah Al-Isra and Surah Al-Furqan. Beginning of Revelation. The revelation of the Quran began in the Laylatul Qadr of Ramadan, the 27th or one of the odd nights of after the 21st. After the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had passed the 40th year of his life, that is around the year 610. During his seclusion in the cave of Hira on, the mountain, on a mountain near Mecca. Bukhari's account. This is the account as reported in the Sahih of Bukhari. 
narrated Aisha radiallahu anha, the mother of the faithful believers, the commencement of the divine inspiration to Allah's apostle was in the form of good dreams, which came like bright daylight, that is true, and then the love of seclusion was bestowed upon him. He used to go into in seclusion in the cave of Hira, where he used to worship Allah alone continuously for his desire to see his family. He used to take with him food for the stay and then come back to his wife Khadija radiallahu anha to take his food likewise again, till suddenly the truth descended upon him while he was in the cave of Hira. The angel came to him and asked him to read. The Prophet ﷺ replied, I do not know how to read. The Prophet ﷺ added, The angel caught me forcibly, caught me forcibly, and pressed me so hard that I could not bear it anymore. He then released me and again asked me to read, and I replied, I do not know how to read. Thereupon, he caught me again and pressed me a second time till I could not bear it anymore. He then released me and again asked me to read. But again, I replied, I do not know how to read or what shall I read? Thereupon, he caught me for the third time and pressed me and then released me and said, read in the name of your Lord who created, created man from a clot, read and your Lord is the most bountiful. The narration goes on to tell us that the Prophet وسلم, went back to his wife Khadija anha and recounted to her his dreadful experience. She comforted him and both of them consulted Waraka, Khadija anha's relative and learned Christian about it. Waraka told Muhammad وسلم, that he had encountered the one whom Allah had sent to Musa salam and that he would be driven out by his people. How revelation came. Narrated Aisha radiallahu anha, the mother of the faithful believers, Al-Harith bin Hisham asked Allah's, Allah's apostle sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, O Allah's apostle, how is the divine inspiration revealed to you? Allah's apostle sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied, sometimes it is revealed like the ringing of a bell. This form of inspiration is the hardest of all. And then this state passes off after I have grasped what is inspired. Sometimes the angel comes in the form of a man and talks to me and I grasp whatever he says. The first revelation. The first revelation that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu received is in the verses of Surah Al-Alaq. Surah 97 verses 1 to 3 according to others 1 to 5. Read in the name of your Lord who created, created man from a clot. Read and your Lord is most bountiful. He took he who taught the use of the pen taught man which is which he knew not. The remainder of Surah 97, which is which now has 19 ayah, was 96 revealed. Surah 96 or 97? Um, nine, nine, 90, it's written 96 here. Um, mm. It's 97 though, isn't it? Is it? Okay, Mr. Lagoha. Double checking on. Um, um, no, 96. Uh, 96. Yeah. Go ahead. Al Qadr 97. Not one yet. Um, the remainder of Surah 96, which now has 19 ayah, was revealed on some later occasion. The pause, Fatra. After the first message thus received, revelation ceased for a certain period called Fatra and then resumed. Narrated Jabir bin Abdullah al-Ansari while talking about the period of pause in revelation, reporting the speech of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. While I was walking, all of, it, all of a sudden, I heard a voice from the heaven. I looked up and saw the same angel who had visited me at the cave of Hira sitting on a chair between the sky and the earth. I got afraid of him and came back home and said, wrap me in blankets. And then Allah revealed the following holy verses of the Quran. O oh, you covered in your cloak, 
Arise and warn the people against Allah's punishment, up to and all pollution shunned. After this revelation came after this revelation came strongly and regularly. The second revelation. The second portion of the Quran revealed to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was was um, the beginning of Surah Al Mudathir, Surah 74, verses 1 to 5. It now consists of 56 verses, the rest revealed later, and begins as follows O you covered in your cloak, arise and warn, thy Lord magnify thy raiment, purify, pollution shun. Other early revelations. Many told that Surah Al Muzammil 73 was the next revelation. According to others, Surah Al Fatiha first was the third surah to be revealed. Among other early revelations, which the Prophet وسلم, declared in Mecca, are according to some reports Surah 111, Surah 81, Surah 87, Surah 92, Surah 89, etc. Then revelation continued, mentioning paradise and hell, and until mankind turned to Islam, then came revelation about halal and haram. Revelation came to the Prophet وسلم, through his lifetime, both in Mecca and Medina, that is, over a period of approximately 23 years, until shortly before his death in the year 10 after Hijrah, 632. The last Just, revelation. Jazakallah khairan Muhammad. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Wa sallamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.